We have a cleanse center, and at our cleanse center, we use a particular medium to help very many people get well. The elixir we use at our center does a number of things. It makes muscles more flexible. This is the first thing. The second thing is it invigorates body and mind. Is there anyone who would like to have a better invigorated body and mind out there tonight? Well, good. You came to the right lecture. It also sharpens the intellect. Now, that's a good thing to have. It lowers blood pressure. It helps remove toxins from the body. It clears up bladder problems. It aids digestion. It lubricates the body. It rebuilds cartilage. It regulates body temperature, keeps bowels regular, and relieves depression. We use a lot of this at our center. Now tell me, is there anyone out there tonight who would like to buy a bottle of this? Yes? A number of hands are going up. Great. The forgotten liquid miracle. Water. What you're going to hear tonight, you'll want to take with you and I think this can forever change the way you look at water. Imagine trying to wash your car with a small pail of dirty water. That is exactly what you're doing to your body if all you are getting into your daily regime is about two glasses of water has the same effect on your body. Now every function of the body is monitored and pegged to the efficient flow of water. And I just wanted to pause right there for a minute. Your brain monitors every single place in your body. It tells how much water is present around the heart, around the liver, around the kidneys, around every single body tissue. And if there is not enough water, then your brain will tell your body to move water from a less needed area and move it to the more dangerous area. So if you're not putting enough water in, your body has to draw water from other areas to supply the needs in more uh, specific areas. Does that make sense to you? Okay, your brain monitors everything. You know, what you think even has a tremendous amount to do with the health of your body. I once saw an operation where it was open heart surgery and for the operation they had to disconnect the heart and pump the blood through a machine that would keep it going through the body while they worked on the heart. Now interestingly enough, they had to monitor the brain during this whole operation simply because if the brain pattern started to get very irregular and erratic, they would have to reconnect the heart. Now after about an hour and a half to two hours at that particular time, that's as long as they could go without the brain acting up. Now, why would the brain act up if the blood was being pumped through the body? It's a good question. Even though the blood was pumped through the body, the brain realized the heart is not giving me a message. There's no communication between the brain and the heart. Now, when they saw that brain patterns go really rigid, they reconnected the heart and the brain patterns came back down to normal. Isn't that interesting? So you see, your brain has a very intimate relationship with every organ in your body. And if the water is deficient in any 
web majorly needed areas such as the heart of the lungs, it'll pull from other areas of the body. Okay, every organ of the body that produces a substance to be made available to the rest of the body will only monitor its own rate and standards of production and release into the flowing water according to constantly changing quotas set by the brain. Once the water itself reaches the drier areas, it also exercises its many other most vital and missing physical and chemical regulatory actions. It's a complicated process, but not something we even need to think about. If we drink enough water, it looks after itself. Isn't that nice to know? You don't have to tell the water to go anywhere. The brain looks after it. And me, being a Christian physician, I say, that is a marvelous design. That's incredible. Okay, water will be taken from the bowel and from the blood to maintain body temperature. This can produce constipation and elevate blood pressure. In your blood, did you know that three-fifths of that is water? And if there's not enough water in other areas of the body, sometimes the brain will take water from the blood. Uh-oh. And there it goes into the tissues, and we end up with health problems. How many glasses of water does the average body use in one day? Is there anybody who can tell me? Do I hear four? Do I hear 40? Starting to sound ridiculous. Do I hear 400? Is anyone willing to say 4,000? Is anyone willing to say 40,000 cups of water? That's how much your body uses in a day. I thank God I don't have to drink that much water in a day. I only have to replace whatever gets lost. And that's the beauty of it. Could you imagine? Where does all this water go? You see, the body recycles the water that it has to use through the kidneys, through the tissues, and so on and so forth. Where does it all go? Five to six cups are lost through urination, if you're having enough. Two cups are exhaled. Did you know you put out moisture on your breath? And that moisture is part of your water loss. A half cup is lost through the bowels, and two cups are given off through the skin, through sensible and insensible perspiration. Okay? Now, it is absolutely amazing to me that the body can go through so many cups of water and only lose six to eight cups a day out of 40,000 cups. That is a tremendously efficient system. And some people say, well, I'm getting water in my coffee. There's liquid there. That doesn't count. That doesn't count at all. Every cup of coffee you put into your body will take out two cups of water to process it. So you're at a loss. And it's the same thing with soft drinks, your colas and things like this. Not a good way to get your liquid. Now, some interesting experiments were done with athletes. Athletes cruising at a speed, I believe it's a light jog, at about 3.5 miles per hour. Three different groups. The first group had no water, then the second group had water as they felt thirsty, and the third group had water as calculated. In other words, every two minutes they'd give them maybe two ounces of water. It was regulated. Now, what happened was, as they started going, the first people that had absolutely no water lasted three and a half hours, and at the end of the three and a half hours, their temperature was 102 degrees. The second group, having water when they were thirsty lasted six hours. And at the end of six hours, their temperature was 102 degrees. And the third group that had water as calculated lasted seven plus hours and they had to stop the experiment simply because they could not raise body temperature. It was kept at a good, healthy, normal body temperature, 98.6. Isn't that interesting? Now, that shows us some things. Thirst is not a dependable indicator of body water requirements. Secondly, there is a close relationship between water consumption and fatigue. Notice that word, 
fatigue. How many people today have you heard with chronic fatigue syndrome, CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome? Whenever I've had people in my office and they have chronic fatigue syndrome and I tell you it, it seems to be going wild. Everybody's suffering from this. And I say, how much water do you get to drink throughout the day? And they'll say, oh, when they go like that, I know it's, it's going to be something really low. It's usually two glasses, maybe three. Um, how much water do you drink in a day? <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe like two. I don't know. Like if you're talking just like a glass of water, maybe two cups. I should drink more. Probably about one. <laughs> oh, probably three glasses. Uh, maybe four to six. I drink like two. Uh, probably not enough. Maybe three glasses. Have you heard of hydroelectric power? That's where they have a dam and water flows through the dam and moves the turbines, right? In the cells of your body, the membrane of your cell, when the water goes through the membrane of the cell, its, it's energy that it takes to go through the cell is converted into hydroelectric power in your body. And that is what your cell runs off of. Isn't that interesting? We think that we're great at inventing things. Just about everything we've invented comes from looking at the things God has created. We've got nothing new. We copy. Have you ever noticed that? But I thought I'd share that with you. That's an interesting thing to think about. Now, water has a significant effect on body temperature control. Also, more active people need more water. These are the four things the experiment provided us with. Now, in the amphibian species, it has been shown that histamine reserves and their rate of generation are at minimal levels. In the same species, histamine generation becomes established and gets pronounced whenever the animal is dehydrated. Have you ever known anybody who's needed an antihistamine? Have you? Try telling them, drink water. That's what your body's trying to tell you. Have more water. Histamine and its subordinate water intake and distribution regulators, that's prostaglandins, kinins, and PAF, another histamine-associated agent, also cause pain when they come across pain-sensing nerves in the body. You know people that have pain and the doctors cannot find out why they just have pain? Because they're very low in water in most cases, unless it would be as a pain as a result of an accident. Thus, when histamine generation becomes excessively active, the thirst signal is manifested by allergies, asthma, and chronic pains in different parts of the body. Asthma. Imagine that. Usually asthma is caused from a deficiency of water and a toxic liver. Since there's not enough water to moisten the little capsules in the lungs, what happens is the body will draw mucus into the area to protect the airways from drying out. And this produces what? Asthma. And so what do we do? We're told, take a puffer. Try putting water in. We've seen asthmatics reverse their asthma in less than a week. Totally reverse it. Isn't that amazing? One dear lady, she went from using, I believe it was, one to two puffers every two days or three days to none. Zero. Just amazing. Are you beginning to see the benefits of this marvelous creation? Water. Now, the clinical signs of dehydration are pain, fatigue, dry mouth, strong dark yellow urine, and constipation. Remember what I shared with you in the first lecture? One of the highest over-the-counter selling medications is what? Laxatives. Exactly. Laxatives. So that's got to tell you something. People are not getting enough water. Now, in the stomach, as a for instance, if there's not, if you look at this picture on the left-hand side, you see uh, up here there's a thick mucus layer. Oh, and that's in a well-hydrated stomach wall lining. Over here, there's a very dehydrated mucus layer, and you see the difference? It's almost half the size. Now, in this particular one on the right, if you've got food digesting in your system, 
The foods will not be neutralized properly by the mucus layer, which has in it, by the way, bicarbonate. Instead, it goes through to the glands layer and sometimes through to the muscle layer, producing stomach ulcers and pain in digestion. Now, if a person has two glasses of water, warm water, about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes before a meal, the mucus layer becomes very well thickened and bicarbonate is developed and released by the pancreas in the mucus layer and it neutralizes all the acids used in the digestion of food so they don't get to the uh, glands layer and to the muscle layers. Isn't that interesting? If somebody has ulcers and pains in the stomach when they're digesting food, tell them to have some water before their meal. It may help tremendously. Water, so simple. Does it matter what type of water I drink? How many have heard that question? Uh, should it be distilled water? Should it be mineral water? Should it be reverse osmosis water? Well, what kind of water? Should I open my mouth and just receive the rain? What is it? What should I have? Well, let's just take a look. A person drinking about two pints of natural water a day, that's any water other than distilled water, will consume 200 to 300 pounds of inorganic minerals during a 70-year lifespan. I took water, my own experiment, in a distiller from a town in Alberta where we used to have a cleanse center, and I took a one-week period of running water through this distiller, 25 gallons a day. At the end of one week, I cleaned out my distiller. This was town water. I cleaned the distiller, and I got a one-quart jar of something that looked like muck, thick clay, and it smelled Horrible. It was a, a chemical cesspool. I couldn't believe it. And that was out of one week, 25 gallons a day. Right there. Isn't that something? And that's what we're running through our systems, and we don't see it in the glass. But it's there in small amounts, enough that you can get a whole buildup in your system over the years if you keep on doing it. We've had people come to us that have been on well water, and they've had pains in their joints. And as soon as they come to the center, we'd put them on distilled water. And guess what happened? Their pains went away. They went back home, got on the well water, and all of a sudden, the pains came back. When they went on the distilled water, the pains disappeared. That's very interesting. Okay. <clears throat> Spring water contains an amount of earthy ingredients which is fearful to contemplate. It has been calculated that water of an average quantity, or pardon, pardon me, quality, contains so much carbonate and other compounds of lime that a person drinking an average quantity each day will, in 40 years, have taken as much into his body as would form a pillar of solid chalk or marble as large as a good-sized man. So great is the amount of lime in spring water that the quantity taken daily would alone be sufficient to choke up the system so as to bring on decrepitude and death long before we arrived at 20 years of age were it not for the kidneys and other secreting organs throwing it off in considerable quantities. So your body does its best to survive. All your body knows how to do is live and survive. And everything it does for you is, is helping you to live longer. And many times when we see symptoms such as the pain and things, what do we want to do? Tell me, class, what is it? We want a pain reliever or some kind of medication. And a lot of times, this is how we've been brought up. For every symptom, there's a medication. For every symptom, there's water. We had a man, a friend of ours, he was suffering from degenerative disc disease. When we went to visit him one time, he was sitting in a chair and he had his leg up on the table. It was the only position he could sit in without severe pain. I said, what is the problem? He said, well, I've been diagnosed with degenerative disc disease and I need to have an operation, but I have to decide because there's a 50-50 chance that I could become a paraplegic from this operation and I don't want to take the chance, but he was wincing with the pain. And he said, is there anything I can do? I said, how much water do you drink a day? He said, about a glass. I said, how much coffee do you drink? He said, oh, two to four cups, depends. 
I said, how much green salad do you eat? He said, well, usually on the weekend we have a salad. I said, would you like to avoid that operation? He said, I sure would. You see, I knew that most of the cartilage in between the vertebrae is made up of water. If the body does not get enough water, talk with me now, what's it going to do? It's going to pull water from areas to service other areas that need the water. In this brother's case, the water was being pulled from the cartilage and it caused the discs to compress and press on the nerves, excruciating pain. So now he's going to have an operation. I'm glad to tell you what I told him to do. I said, you need to have between 12 to 20 glasses of water each day and you need to have two huge green leafy salads every day. He said, you've got to be kidding. I'll be by the toilet all day. 12 to 20 glasses. So I said, do you want to avoid the operation? Try this. So he did. We came back to see him in three weeks. We found him underneath his car working on it. Something he hadn't done in almost 20 years. When he came out from under the car, he said, I'm about 90% healed. Very little pain. Amazing. Isn't that neat? I really like hearing things like this because tell me something. What did I do? Nothing. I told him what his body could do. Feed your body the tools it needs to get well and it's going to get well. And that's all he did. He gave the body the tools it needed and the body healed itself. And this is the case in most of the cases. That's what happens. Now, doesn't distilled water leach minerals from the body? Has anybody heard that? <clears throat> I want to tell you something. A half truth is more dangerous and deadly than a bold-faced lie. You see, distilled water will leach minerals from the system, but it only leaches minerals that shouldn't be there to begin with. That's the other part of the equation. Distilled water will never attract organically bound minerals from bones or tissues. Tens of thousands of people who are on dialysis machines using distilled water bear witness to the fact that distilled water does not leach out organically bound minerals from the bones or the tissues. Minerals in mineral water are dead. I'm going to speak to you as a Christian if I may. When God made green plants and plants all over the earth on day number three, those plants were designed to pull dead minerals out of the soil, pull them up through their roots, attach a living protein enzyme to the mineral through photosynthesis, making it a living mineral. Now our bodies can use living minerals, but for you to drink mineral water, you might as well just pick up a handful of dirt and eat it because the minerals in the dirt are just as alive as the minerals in that mineral water. If you put distilled water into your system, the first thing it'll do when it hits your stomach is it will become stabilized. They say that distilled water is not stabilized. Well, it'll become stabilized as soon as it hits your stomach. The only thing that goes into distilled water, as far as minerals go, will be the minerals that are, the body can't use, that the body has rejected outside the cellular tissue. As is experienced by the people who have the joint pain, they have inorganic minerals around their joints. And when the distilled water comes in, the inorganic minerals are carried out. Now think of this. If, if distilled water leaches minerals from the body, then what does the distilled water become? Mineral water. <laughs> okay? You have to reason from the end right through to the beginning and from the beginning to the end. Nothing is more deadly or dangerous than a half-truth. A bold-faced lie is not near as damaging. So you see, a little education in something can be a dangerous thing.
I hope this makes sense to you. Distilled water is absolutely incredible. So, distilled water collects and removes minerals which have been rejected by the cells of the body and are therefore debris, obstructing the normal functions of the system. Try drinking nothing but distilled water for two or three weeks. Have a urinalysis made before you start and see if you will not be astonished at the mineral sediments in the urine after a mere three weeks. And those mineral sediments will be all dead in organic minerals which shouldn't have been in your system to begin with. Now, if you're cooking your foods, I want to get back to something else here. If you're cooking your foods, you are heating the enzymes higher than 107 degrees. And if there's minerals in a food and the enzyme around the mineral dies after 107 degrees, what is that mineral going to become? It's going to become a dead mineral. So it becomes inorganic. So try to have most of your foods from the living side. And this will help you to replace the minerals. Thousands have died for want of pure, and pure water and pure air who might have lived. These blessings they need in order to become well. If they would become enlightened and let medicine alone and accustom themselves to outdoor exercise and to air in their houses summer and winter and use soft water for drinking and bathing purposes, they would be comparatively well and happy instead of dragging out a miserable existence. How much water do we need to drink? Well, here's the clue. One ounce of water for every two pounds of body weight. This is an excellent way to measure. If you weigh 100 pounds, you'd need 50 ounces of water. That's easy to figure out. Now, if you get three-fifths of your blood well stabilized with water, we've seen high blood pressure even come down by adding water. When you get three-fifths of your blood well established with water, the rest of the water you drink will start to go to the tissues to replenish them. And by the way, it's going to make you look younger. Okay, when the tissues are filled out, you'll look younger. If you were to drink three liters of water a day, three liters a day, for six weeks, I would challenge you to take a picture of yourself, take a picture of your face before you start and at the end of six weeks. And you see if you can see a difference. People are going to say, you, you look younger. What are you doing? Are you using some kind of cream to, to make your skin look good? No. I'm using water, nature's remedy, just straight water. It is absolutely rich and beautiful. So, when you're drinking your water, by the way, I wanted to tell you, sip your water. Don't say, I need, I need eight glasses of water today, so here I go, glug, 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 one, <laughs> glug, 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 two, glug, glug, three. You know what I'm saying? Drinking it all at once, because your body can only utilize two to three ounces at once. So sipping your water is the best thing, except when you're starting your meal, you want to have lots of water flushing through to put that mucus layer in your stomach. But sip your water and you'll find you won't go to the bathroom as much. Instead, your body will use that water to rehydrate the bloodstream. It'll also rehydrate the tissues, the bones, the brain. It all needs to be rehydrated, and that's a very good way to do it. Now, here are some simple water remedies, things you can do at home. The neutral bath. This is a fantastic way to help with insomnia. It helps with pain in the body as well. Fill a bathtub with water, and the average temperature of the bath must be maintained at 93 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. That's slightly cool. You put a thermometer in the water and make sure the temperature stays right there between 93 and 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And you sit in that water or lay in that water up to your neck. Just let the body rest, and it feels actually very, very comfortable on you. This will relax all of your body muscles, relieving tension. It is incredible. The longer you sit in this, the better. In the early 1900s, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, whose brother invented Kellogg's cornflakes, actually stole the recipe from John Harvey, <laughs> but he got Kellogg's cornflakes. <clears throat> it's very interesting because he would have people 
who were suffering from various afflictions and muscle tension and sometimes they'd be in a pool for three or four hours and the temperature was 93 to 95 degrees kept there and they discovered many aches and pains disappearing. Incredible things happen with water. Next, for insomnia, soak in the water for 15 to 60 minutes. Towel off and go directly to bed afterward and you should sleep very well make quite a difference when your muscles become relaxed. Don't take a muscle relaxer, use water. It's safe and easy to use and there's no bad reactions from it. Does everyone have that? Well that's good. A hot foot soak. Fill a pail of water with 100 degree Fahrenheit uh, high enough to cover ankles. So you start it at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you're going to increase that temperature as you go along. Wrap a blanket around the person and closing the pail. I like to actually start it at about 105 to 110 degrees. And that doesn't feel hot to your fingers, but it feels really hot on your feet. You have very sensitive nerves in your feet and it'll feel really hot. But if you keep your feet in there, you'll receive some marvelous benefits. It's great for pain anywhere in the body. Next, add hot water as the patient can tolerate it up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. I've never seen anybody who can tolerate it that, that high. That won't burn you. It's just that it feels very, very hot. Make sure they're wrapped up nice and snug with that blanket and the blanket covers the pail as well. And make sure you have your thermometer in there. When you pour the hot water in to make the temperature hotter, make sure you have your hand there, pour the boiling water in and stir it around well so it doesn't land in one spot and you burn the person's feet. Okay? Continue the treatment for 5 to 30 minutes. Let the water just keep getting hotter and hotter. And they'll start to sweat and go, oh, this feels very uncomfortable. When it starts to feel very uncomfortable, that's when you need to keep on going. Just let it sit right there. Then to complete the treatment, raise the feet out of the pail and pour ice water over the feet. Then dry with a towel. And then you put on thick warm socks and rest in bed for 30 minutes. We had one person who didn't believe this. It was a student of ours. And this student had back pain. And so we took him, put him on the chair, did all of these things. And you know what happened? Before he ever went to go and lay down, he said, I don't believe it. My pain is gone. I've never been able to get rid of this pain completely. And it's totally gone. Isn't that interesting? So now he could get a good night's sleep for a change. A heating compress. This works fantastic. Wring out a piece of cotton material from cold water so that it does not drip. Now if you've got a sore throat happening, you put this on and do this treatment overnight and in the morning your sore throat's totally gone. That's how easy it is. These are all things you can do at home. Have a child with a sore throat, anybody you know with a sore throat. And by the way, this will work for tennis elbow as well. I'm going to show you how. Wrap this piece of cotton material snugly around the neck. Snug. Don't strangle. Just nice and snug. Apply a piece of plastic around the neck so that the cotton cloth stays moist. You don't want it to lose that nice liquid. And then completely cover the cotton so that the air does not circulate. Cover, a cover the uh, plastic with a piece of wool material and pin it securely in place. Okay? And then you leave it on overnight. I'm going to show you how this works. I'm going to tell you how it works. When you put the cold cloth on the neck, it will draw blood into the area to warm up the neck. As the neck becomes warm, then the cloth becomes warm. The water becomes warm on the cloth. And what's the body going to do when that happens? It's going to move blood out of the neck to cool down the area. Now what happens when the area becomes cooled down? The blood comes back in to heat it up. So all night long you've got this blood exchange, fresh blood coming in and out of the neck area. And what's that going to do to virus and bacteria that may be in the throat area? It's going to wipe them out. If you didn't have this water treatment taking place, you'd have very little blood flow going in, out, in, out, in, out all night long. Person doesn't have to think about it. And in the morning, 
Everything's wonderful. Now we had a man come to one of our seminars and this man was one of the greatest skeptics you could ever imagine. So guess what happened to him? He caught himself a real cold. Actually, you earn a cold. He earned himself a real bad cold. And it went on day after day getting worse and worse and worse till he could finally, he couldn't talk. So his wife said, why don't you do that crazy heating compress around your neck? And he said, all right. So he did. Put it on overnight. He says, I'll prove them wrong. Guess what happened in the morning? It was totally healed. <laughs> he became a believer. It was that simple. And you can do this at home. Now, sauna. Saunas are great. You see, God designed that we should sweat. That's why we have a, a sweating apparatus. Some people find they can't sweat. This simply means that your sweat glands have shrunk. They need to be reactivated. If you persist in getting them to reactivate, they will. You sit in the sauna for 15 minutes. Nice and hot. Get it as hot as you can. Sit there for 15 minutes. Step directly into a cold shower for 30 seconds. I know you don't like that idea, but this is very good for stimulating your lymphatic system and for your sweating system. Repeat this three times. So in other words, you, you're in the sauna for 15 minutes, go have a cold shower. Go back in the sauna for 15 minutes, have a cold shower. Then back in the sauna for 15 minutes, have another cold shower. And by that time, the cold shower is welcome. You just love it. You can't wait to get to it. It feels very good. Then you lay down for half an hour. Now what happens is, normally in your body, you've got about 1,200 white blood cells circulating, just going around, taking care of things. When you finish doing this, you have about 40,000 white blood cells circulating in your body. And what will those cells do? They'll start to dissolve things which shouldn't be in your body. Cysts, tumors, bacteria, things like this that shouldn't be there. So what you're doing is you're reactivating your immune system. Do these things make sense to you? It sound easy? Does it sound like they'll actually work? I bear testimony they do. You know, once I had I was talking outside with somebody we were living in Alberta, northern Alberta, and it was 40 below, and I was outside talking, not dressed properly, for about half an hour. When my wife and I got home, I went and I had a hot shower, then a cold shower. Not a good thing to do if you're feeling a chill. So that night I developed pneumonia. And so what my wife did the next day was, actually it was the next day I really started to get worse and worse, really fatigued. And I was coughing up green phlegm. And then I was coughing up green phlegm with black flecks in it. That's, that's, <laughs> that's really bad. So uh, she did some hot fomentations, hot and cold fomentations on my chest and on my back. She did about a half hour worth of treatment twice that night. The next morning I woke up, no pneumonia, totally gone. We phoned a nurse friend of ours I told her what happened. I said, I was coughing up green phlegm. She goes, oh, we'd put you on antibiotics right away, heavy-duty antibiotics. And I said, well, I was coughing up black flecks in the green phlegm. She says, we'd put you in ICU. That's it. And we put major antibiotics. And she said, you were rid of it in just 24 hours? I said, yes. She says, what kind of drugs did you use? So I told her what I did, and she goes, I don't believe this. She said, I knew about this, but I've never heard of it working like that. And there it was. So you see, water is a great way to enable your body's immune system to just work very well. Now, a detox bath. If you feel like you've got a lot of toxins built up in your body, here's something you can do. It's incredible. Fill a tub with hot water. Add one and a half cups of baking soda or two pounds of Epsom salts but preferably the baking soda. What this will do is it'll cause the water to be super alkaline. And when that water is super alkaline, it's going to pull toxins through the pores of your skin. Soak for 15 to 20 minutes. And while you're soaking for that 15 to 20 minutes, have a loofah sponge with you. You know what a loofah sponge is? You can pick them up at Zellers or drugstores. Just get a loofah sponge and start scrubbing your skin with the loofah sponge. And you'll discover the bath water turning gray because toxins are coming out. 
And I encourage people to uh, make sure you have somebody around when you're having this water, this bath, because the bath water should be about 105 degrees. And it's very warm to get into and it can give you a false temperature. And we wouldn't want you to pass out in the bathtub, so make sure you leave the door open. Somebody's out there that can say, hey, how are you doing? Say, I'm just doing fine. Make sure that you, uh, by the way, uh, before you would get in a tub of water like that for any kind of length of time, make sure that you don't have a heart problem. Okay, so good to consult your doctor before doing something like this. So if you know you don't have a heart problem, well, you should be all right. Nice warm temperature. And then after you finish with the tub, you get out, wrap up in a large towel and blanket to keep you sweating. Lay down for 15 minutes. Finish with a cool shower. Not cold, but cool. And this works very, very well. Now I've just shown you some things about water. Have you learned anything new? Things you never knew before about water. Are you interested in adding more water to your diet? I'm glad to see that. Now, if you want to get all the water in that you should be drinking in a day, start off your morning with a couple of glasses of nice room temperature or slightly warmer water. Not hot, never hot. Always nice warm water. And have that about 15 to 20 minutes before breakfast. And you'll be giving yourself a good start to the day. It'll help your bowels to move better too. And then after breakfast is over, wait at least one hour before you start sipping on your water for the day. Many times when people feel hungry and it's only been an hour or two after a meal, it is your body telling you, give me water. It's that simple. We haven't learned how to read our body. So the body's saying, give me water. Do that. Start sipping on it. Take a bottle with you and measure an amount that you would need for the day. And then make sure you drink that amount, sipping and sipping. Stop drinking your water about 20 minutes before a meal. And you'll discover, if you do your drinking of water this way, when it comes mealtime, you're not thirsty. It's best to not have liquid with your meals. And again, start drinking your water about an hour not, not less, but at least an hour after your meal starts sipping again. And then before supper, about 20 minutes before supper, stop drinking your water. And then after supper, it's good not to have water at all. Um, so you don't keep getting up through the night. <laughs> It'll help you to sleep. So stop your water drinking by about 6 o'clock at night and you should be just fine through the night. Sound good? And by the way, isn't it interesting? Water's a liquid, it's ice, and it's a vapor, but it's still water. That's three in one. I know who made that water. And it says he's three in one. I believe he's greater than the water he made. And just for those who may be feeling spiritually inclined here this evening, do you know that the purest water that I've spoken to you about, the purest water put into your system produces wonderful results in your body. Taking out the things that shouldn't be there and giving wonderful life-giving properties to the living tissues. Now, Jesus Christ called himself, I am the water of life. When we partake of that pure water of life of Jesus, it has a way of purifying every single part of our life. And the more you add, the more it purifies. So add a little every day. Sip on it. Don't try and take Jesus all at once in the morning and expect you've got enough to do you all day. Sip on that wonderful Christian experience throughout the day. Have a prayer. Think on some verse you studied in the morning. And this will be drinking because Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. And this is the peace that each person seeks. I know it. So may you be blessed by this evening's presentation, and I hope that this proves a benefit to you and to your families. God bless you.